Hello and welcome to tonight a date from the RSGB. Whilst most of us probably use the same antenna to both transmit and receive, our guest tonight, Eric Nichols, KL7AJ, suggests that it's actually much better to have two separate aerials, each optimised to be either the best for transmission or reception. Let's find out more. Welcome to Tonight at Eight, Eric. Can you give us a quick preview of what you'll be talking about this evening? Well, absolutely, and I do want to thank you for inviting me here. I have a long association with the RSGB, although I have never been to England, but that's on my bucket list. But uh, here's my treasured copy of the 1964 uh, RSGB handbook. <laughs> well, I have a, a, that was presented to me very soon after I became a ham, so uh, I have a, a very much a... Uh, uh, affinity for, for uh, you across the pond there. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, um, most of us take it for granted that, uh, and it, it's a matter of convenience, that uh, uh, reciprocity is always going to work in our favor. And for the most part, it, it does. But there, there are many cases where having a specialized receive antenna or just a different antenna for reception is going to be a lot more beneficial. So that's uh, kind of the... the it in well, a nutshell. Well, we look forward to that, Eric. And before your presentation, a reminder that if you're watching this on Monday, the 3rd of July, then this is live. Is. And you can ask questions and make comments on either BATC <coughs> or YouTube chat at any time during the presentation or straight afterwards. Please include your first name and call sign if you have one within every message. And note that you can make this video stream fill your screen on most devices, usually by double clicking on the picture or pressing the full screen button. But now back to Eric to find out why receiving aerials are different. Yeah. Well, first of all, another little side note here. Tomorrow is uh, July 4th, which is our uh, 247th uh, anniversary of that little spat we have with you. So we're certainly glad <laughs> that we're on much better terms nowadays. <laughs> oh, yes. So anyway, uh, let's see uh, a little bit about me, I guess. Uh, I've been hamming, as my QSL card says here, since 1972. Uh, first license in 1972 is WN6TEE in Manhattan Beach, California. And that was an interesting call sign because whenever I sent it out, everybody said WN6D, so I had to really stretch it out. And as a, as a novice, it was hard enough to get anything said, but uh, <laughs> five words a minute. But anyway, upgraded to 1974 with a call sign WA6TE, and that was our general class license, which was probably equivalent to your intermediate and moved to Fairbanks, Alaska in 1976, uh, obtained an amateur ad, or an advanced class license of KL7JDC, which only I had for a few months, and then moved to North Pole in 1977 and have been KL7AJ ever since. However, after 46 years in North, North Pole, uh, we moved up to uh, the bustling metropolis of Fairbanks. Actually, we, we're not in the city limits, we're north of it, but a uh, much higher altitude and not quite as cold. Uh, I have experience in uh, high-powered uh, and basically uh, spent all my life doing QRO, worked as a chief engineer of a 50,000-watt uh, radio station up here. And uh, after many years of that, I started working in uh, ionospheric research. And uh, we had a facility called High Pass, which is actually the predecessor to HARP. Uh, most of you are probably at least marginally familiar with HARP. So I was on the ground floor of uh, putting HARP together. And... Uh, even as we speak, uh, we're we're building kind of a mini harp down in Wyoming. So using a lot of what we learned there and uh, learned that, hey, perhaps we could get by with a little bit less power than we, we had at harp there, which was basically one gigawatt of uh, ERP. So, well, that's uh, an interesting project uh, going on here. Uh, let's see. I've uh, been writing for a little while. I uh, wrote my first article in uh, 1983 and illustrated by Jim Masara. And to EST, which you who also designed my QSL card, an incredibly talented uh, cartoonist and uh, a uh, great, great humorist. So uh, uh, I, humor is a, a great part of amateur radio and always has been. And I've noticed some of my heroes who have been uh, the greatest technical writers have also been some of the funniest guys on the planet. So, <laughs> so uh, I, I've uh, uh, adopted a bit of a warped sense of humor from, from that. Uh, let's see, a uh, two-time recipient of the William Orr W6SAI Technical Writing Award uh, issued by AWRL. So uh, let's see, work with Gordon West, W5YI Group. I've been uh, helping uh, writing uh, amateur radio training materials for, for many years. And my latest, uh, no, this is not my latest, but uh, 
the Opus of Amateur Radio book is uh, is probably my most fun publication uh, so far. A uh, very tongue-in-cheek look at amateur radio. And I have a whole section on there on translating American into English. So uh, maybe you'd, <laughs> you'd get a kick out of that. So anyway, enough about me. Let's get the show on the road. Okay, receiving antennas are different. And uh, I guess we could emphasize or uh, restate this, saying that the priorities of receiving antennas are different than transmitting. In a transmitting antenna, your main point is getting as much signal from point A to point B as, as possible. So you want to launch as much power as you can. Uh, gain is very um, important because it increases your effective uh, transmitter power. So if we could take a simple antenna with a known gain, let's say we have a seven decibel gain antenna like a, a typical Yagi on uh, HF, uh, we, we get about, uh, you know, equivalent to uh, uh, four times our, our transmitter power. So it's always a, it's never going to hurt to have uh, antenna gain on the transmit side. However, on, uh, receive, on the receiving side, our priorities are different because not only do we want to have a strong signal, but we want to reduce the interference that, that's inevitably going to occur there. So the real name of the game is signal to noise ratio, not necessarily signal strength itself. Now, as far as reciprocity is concerned, for a given signal strength, the gain of an antenna is going to be exactly the same as it is in transmit. So if we have a certain known signal strength and we have a seven decibel gain antenna for receiving, it's going to give us, uh, you know, approximately four to four times as, bu as much power on the receiving end. But our priority is going to be different because uh, when we're receiving, we not only have to look at the signal that we're, we want, but we have to look at what are we going to do with the signals that we don't want. And especially, and this this is a whole whole other topic, which uh, is uh, far too much too much for this particular uh, talk, but I, I might do that in the future. But anyway, ionospheric refracted signals are not reciprocal, and this is glaringly obvious in interior Alaska, probably a little less uh, in England. <laughs> but uh, we we know exactly why this is so, and uh, one way propagation is actually the norm. Uh, what it turns out to be is anytime there's a magnetic field, the uh, ionosphere becomes what's called a birefringent, which means it has two refractive indices. And these refractive indices are directional dependent. So actually, if, if a true two-way propagation path, a reciprocal propagation path, is actually quite exceptional. Um, again, uh, it's, it's noticeable more in places where you get closer to the magnetic pole. Uh, and if you're on like, for example, a magnetic equator, um, there's an ionospheric research station, or a, I should say an ionoson down in uh, Hicamarca, Peru, which is almost on the magnetic equa equator. And because of that, the, the noticeable difference between, uh, you know, let's say, east and west propagation is, is not that uh, noticeable. But here in Fairbanks, it's absolutely extreme. So uh, we pretty much figure that great circle routes up here are absolutely meaningless. So again, <clears throat> to re-emphasize, uh, signal noise ratio is usually more important than gain for receiving. So first thing we want to do is reduce the noise first, and then add gain if only necessary. How do we reduce noise? Well, a uh, antenna that has a certain amount of gain is going to reduce noise by because it only re going to receive signals from a, a, a helpful direction. Now. Uh, this is one one area where a, a, gain, a high gain antenna, for example, a Yagi, is not going to hurt us. It's never going to hurt to have a high gain antenna for receiving, but it's not always going to be the most effective way of of increasing your signal to noise ratio. So to increase your so signal to noise ratio, we need to reduce the directions, uh, shall we say, or the overall um, you know uh, li line of sight uh, to a, any particular noise source. Um, Traditionally, well, well here, here's something that uh, uh, tells you something about how important it is to reduce the noise level. Now, here's what I call my highly, highly technical test instrument, HTTI. All it is is a screwdriver with a uh, banana plug that you can plug into your antenna on your receiver to do this really neat experiment. So what I usually do is recommend uh, tuning up uh, uh, your receiver up to somewhere in 10 meters uh, where, it's, where it's quiet, not much activity. and this part of the sunspot cycle, it's uh, pretty easy to do. 
and then you listen to the background noise uh, with a with a wide bandwidth. So uh, have your receiver tuned to wide bandwidth with no antenna connected, and then plug this antenna in this HTTI in into your antenna terminals, and you'll hear an increase in background noise. And that background noise is a combination of what's called thermal agitation noise and cosmic noise. Cosmic noise is just basically uh, the noise coming in from all parts of the universe. And uh, uh, it doesn't take that much to actually receive that. But another primary source of noise in, at HF is thermal agitation noise. And that comes from the fact that this screwdriver here <laughs> is not at absolute zero. The fact that you have a piece of wire by virtue of the fact that it's not at absolute zero, it generates noise itself because you've got the random molecular motion. And that's actually a, the limiting factor for the sensitivity that you can get by with the receiver. Because no matter how much gain we have, if we have noise in with mixed in with the signal that we want, we are going to amplify that, that noise just as well. So one of the greatest fallacies or mis, uh, misuses of technology for many hams on HF is to uh, use as much RF gain as possible. Well, uh, not too long ago, uh, radio manufacturers decided that, or discovered, or acknowledged, I guess is a word, better word, that sometimes having all the gain possible is not really the main thing. So most of your HF uh, rigs nowadays have an attenuator on the front end, or some have what's called dynamic range enhancement, which is basically reducing, just reducing the gain of the front end. So any modern receiver has far more gain than we, we can actually use. And that this test here will, will show you that. So if you hear an increase in noise as you plug this uh, HTTI into your antenna terminals, that means that you have all the gain you can possibly use. And again, it's a combination of cosmic noise and thermal agitation noise that, that contributes that. And again, just iterating this visually, if you uh, hear any increase in noise level when connecting the HTTI, you have all the receiver gain you can use. Now, uh, something old, something new, maybe something borrowed. I don't know if it's going to be blue. <laughs> anyway, nothing beats a small high-Q tune loop for low-band HF reception. And this has been known since the beginning of radio. If you look at, uh, I'm, a, I'm a collector of antique radios. I, I don't have any in view of my camera right now, but uh, I, uh, if you look at uh, the early radios for AM broadcast reception, they usually had a, a frame loop on top of them. And that was actually very effective because um, a high-Q uh, tuned loop also has very sharp nulls, and the nulls are, are very important for reducing noise, especially if the noise is from a single direction. Now, if we're talking about atmospheric noise, generally that's uh, kind of omnidirectional or isotropic, but in many cases you'll have a noise source which is uh, right where you don't want it, and by using an antenna with a very sharp null, you can uh, greatly increase your signal to noise ratio. And uh, very small loops uh, can be too extremely high Q, which is also a, an advantage there because it gives you a certain degree of selectivity. The only problem with sharply tuned loops is because they are so, so sharply tuned, you need to retune them as you move across the band. I'm sure some of you have, have played around with, with uh, STLs, uh, small transmitting loops, and the same phenomenon is there. Those uh, are can be very effective, but they also need to be retuned. You only have a few kilohertz of uh, bandwidth available. So every time you QSY, you have to retune your antenna, which can be inconvenient if you don't have uh, a semi, somewhat sophisticated antenna tuning system. So traditionally, uh, for um, especially on low bands, uh, uh, the small tune loop is uh, still king. Uh, quest for infinite gain. Now, <clears throat> one thing that's became very, it's become relatively convenient in uh, recent years is readily available of very low noise FETs. But even more important than that is the, the small whip antenna, the omnidirectional antenna, which is used for shortwave reception, but it also can be used as uh, a separate antenna for, for uh, just general uh, wideband receiving. Uh, the active antenna is a very short antenna that has a preamplifier right at the antenna itself. We'll talk a little bit about that. If we look, take a drink here. If we look at the impedance of an extremely small antenna, let's say a, a small whip antenna, uh, maybe a six six inch whip that's on uh, eighty meters, 
the overall uh, percentage of wavelength is perhaps a, a several hundreds of a wavelength long. So what that does is it makes the impedance extremely high. A whip antenna that's very short has an extremely high impedance uh, because it's mostly capacitive, but the radiation resistance is almost nothing. If we uh, look at the radiation versus uh, reactance of a, an antenna as it approaches a, uh, a half wavelength, the radiation increases, radiation resistance increases, and then the reactance decreases. And, uh, and at resonance, we have no reactance. But a very short antenna, we're basically looking with not, at nothing but uh, reactance, capacitive reactance, which gives the overall impedance extremely high. So what do we do so we don't load that antenna down? We can't plug that antenna directly into a receiver because your typical HF receiver has a uh, input impedance about 50 ohms. So if we've got an antenna that has you know 200,000 ohms of re capacitive reactance, which is not an unreasonable value for a six inch whip at 80 meters, uh, <clears throat> we have to consider that. So how do we do that? How do we make a very short antenna uh, effective? Well, we use a voltage follower, and a uh, voltage follower can apply a, a close to infinite gain. And how does that work? <laughs> if we look, here's a typical, very simple voltage follower circuit, and it can actually be used with a vacuum tube, uh, but uh, the FETs are very convenient. And we look at this, and if we were using a high impedance FET, the input impedance of the circuit coming in from the left it's going to be basically infinite, extremely high. Now we have 2.2 uh, .2 mega ohms of resistance here, which is still going to be much higher resistance than even a, a very short whip. The output impedance may be 10 kilohertz or it can even, even be less, uh, uh, 10 kilo ohms or even less. So if we, if we well, let, let's another ground rule for a voltage follower is we have no voltage gain. Whatever the voltage is going in is going to be the same coming out or usually actually slightly less. There's a, uh, there's a junction drop uh, in, in an FET, just like a, a bipolar transistor. But anyway, a, a voltage follower does not give you any voltage gain. All it does is give you current gain. But how much can we get? Well, if we take a typical example of a, uh, an FET, which may have an input impedance on the order of tera ohms. And if you look at specifications for, for uh, MOSFETs and some of that, it, the input impedance is going to be on the order of tera ohms. Now, in this case, in order to bias it correctly, we do need some resistors on the front end. So it, rather than having tera ohms input impedance, we're going to have something like two mega ohms. It's still extremely high. But the output impedance is on the order of kilo ohms. So even in this particular case here, if we take a, let, well, let's make, talk about the ideal first, because you always want to talk about the ideal before you uh, talk about the practical. Let's say we have a, a true FET, which has infinite input impedance. So let's say we have, oh, 50 microvolts coming in. 50 microvolts is a typical S, S9 signal. And then coming out of this, we have 50 microvolts as well. Well, if we look at the power going into this, if we have infinite input impedance, 50 microvolts across infinite resistance is zero power. And if we look at the output, 50 microvolts, let's say in this particular case, across 6.8 kilo ohms uh, is a, you know, it's a, it's a finite amount of power. Well, if we look at the gain or the power gain of this, if we have any power coming out at all over no power going in, we automatically, or by definition, have infinite power gain. So with a simple FET, amplifier like this at the at the base of a very short whip, we can approach infinite power gain. It's, uh, it's not quite, but we approach it asymptotically as we uh, increase the input impedance and decrease the output impedance. So uh, the, the bottom line is we can get extremely high power gain uh, increases with a simple FET uh, voltage follower. Uh, now, this is not an alien concept. If you have an oscilloscope and you have a high voltage probe on there, you're basically doing the same thing. Uh, this, uh, an antenna, a, a very short whip antenna, or what's kind of the uh, universal term for it is an active antenna, basically is a voltage probe. We aren't trying to match the impedance of an antenna directly to a receiver as we would with a, you know, what we call normal, re normal antenna. 
we were just using the antenna as a voltage probe and then using that uh, FET amplifier to as sort, sort of sampler. We're sampling what the input voltage is, giving us a real voltage output with some real power behind it. And then we can get in, incredibly high power gains. Now, one thing we know about it, a very short antenna is the uh, uh, directional characteristics is pretty much isotropic. As we decrease the length of an antenna relative to wavelength, the closer that approach is being an isotropic uh, receiver. So we don't have the advantage of uh, nulling out uh, unwanted uh, or signals from unwanted directions. So um, the real advantage of active antennas or the place is uh, where you have a uh, situation where you don't have room for a, a full-size antenna, but you want also uh, perhaps want one that's just, uh, just uh, if you have a, a separate receiver, like if you're running uh, uh, two, two receivers in contests or whatever, having a separate receiver for just monitoring is, is really useful. And so um, is if we take, take advantage of the fact that a very short antenna is very broadbanded when applied to a, uh, a voltage follower, uh, is a good all-around uh, receiving antenna, and uh, if you have a short wave, a portable shortwave radio that with just a whip antenna, on, that's kind of the principle that those are used. Except uh, rather than using a broadband, uh, broadband uh, untuned FET, they generally use uh, very highly selective circuits. So everything's you know an engineering compromise. But uh, the point is the signal strength that we have, whatever signal is available can be, um, it's almost becomes irrelevant when we recognize that we can get as much gain as, as, as we want. Another device which hardly anybody uses, but I, I've uh, thrown a few of these together, is a unity gain pre-selector. Now many, uh, with the ad advent of broadband receivers, the front end pre-selector has kind of gone, gone, gone away. <laughs> But uh, actually, it can give you quite a bit of advantage over a normal uh, preamplifier. So, but you don't want a lot of voltage gain. So it's basically a, a pre-selector using a, uh, a uh, FET or a source follower there. So then you get the advantage of the high, very high power gain, but you also aren't going to overload your receiver by giving it too much voltage. So, uh, so something you may look into as a great uh, homebrew project. And I, I have some plans for them if uh, somebody's interested later. Using your nulls, again, we don't get sharp nulls with uh, active and active antennas, very short whips, but small tune loops have very sharp nulls. As a matter of fact, if you take the time to uh, adjust both the, the, the amplitude and the phase, we can actually get an infinitely sharp null with a, a small tune loop. And even with you know moderately careful construction, you can, you can get uh, nulls as, as sharp as 80 decibels, so not a great deal of, uh, of uh, pain. So uh, a small tune loop is, uh, again, very, very old method of, uh, of getting a low noise receiver, but it's, uh, it's also uh, very useful. For, it's also useful for directional direction finding. However, you have to be aware that when you're using a small loop for direction finding, you have 180 degree ambiguity. So it's going to be, you're going to have a null from either the direction it's, the signal is coming from or 180 degrees off. So uh, most direction finding and uh, methods have what's called a uh, sense in it, antenna, which allows you to eliminate the the wrong 180 degree uh, <laughs> signal there. So uh, sense antennas are uh, uh, they've been around as long as direction finding an antenna. So that's another interesting uh, technique. Um, I don't know how many of you have been around on uh, uh, 80 meter um, fox hunts. There was a great RSGB film from about 1949 that uh, shows a great fox hunt there using uh, on 80 meters. And I thought that was absolutely fabulous. Everybody here, when we're doing fox hunts, we're usually on, on two meters. So uh, I try to introduce uh, local hams into the joys of doing a, a long distance fox hunt. And 80 meters is a very interesting band for doing that on. Which brings us to our next uh, topic here. Ferrite loop sticks are also very effective uh, receiving antennas. Now, most of us uh, are familiar with ferrite loop sticks because your standard uh, AM uh, portable uh, transistor radio uh, relied on a loop stick for that. 
nowadays that the AM broadcast band is kind of going the way of uh, way a lot of things. And uh, uh, I, I I used to listen to a lot, a lot of European long wave uh, broadcasts, and uh, I, I'm kind of sad to see so many of the, the long wave broadcasts going away. But that's kind of life. But anyway. Uh, for those old timers who've been around for a while, we know that the, the ferry loop stick was built into just about every uh, radio transmitter or radio receiver. And ferry loop stick has the same directional characteristics as uh, a larger frame loop. It's just obviously a lot smaller because it has a high permeability core. And um, they also a ferry loop stick also has a very sharp null and has two of them, just uh, as any nulling type antenna will have. You'll have uh, two, two nulls uh, 180 degrees apart. So we have to take care to, uh, if we're using that for direction finding, to eliminate the uh, ambiguous uh, uh, 180, 180 degree wrong uh, answer. Uh, let's see here. Next. Oh, shielded loop fallacy. Now, uh, many construction uh, projects over many years have advocated the shielded loop, the, the electrostatically shielded loop. And this is basically where you have a, uh, a multi-turn loop, which is either uh, made out of coaxial cable, or it can be uh, just a, a multi-turn wire with uh, aluminum wrapped around it, and then a, a small gap in the in the shielding. And uh, you need the gap in the shielding so you can get some uh, magnetic field through. Well. Uh, these have all, often been uh, incorrectly sold as being noise-reducing antennas. Now, the electrostatic shielding has absolutely nothing to reduce noise directly. However, it does help you maintain the directivity and the null pattern of a loop, and that can reduce noise. In other words, it makes your antenna have a uh, sharper null, so then you can take advantage of it. If you have uh, metallic objects near a magnetic loop antenna, uh, they can uh, upset the the radiation pattern of that, and that's why all your ship to shore or all the ship bound uh, sh shipboard uh, direction finding antennas are very high, highly shielded. So, again, this is very old technology. Um, shielded loops have been around as long as radio, <laughs> but uh, we understand that a shielded loop is uh, again is not inherently lower noise. It just allows us to take advantage of the the ideal prop, ideal pattern that we can have with the loop. Uh, noise, other noise castling methods, and there are several devices that are uh, commercially available for doing this, is using a separate noise antenna and a phase nulling circuit. Uh, MFJ makes uh, one that, at least, uh, I don't know how popular MFJ is uh, in England, but uh, that's one of the main, uh, one of our primary sources of, uh, you know, accessory widgets for the ham shack. But anyway, these are uh, very effective and I've used them a, a bit myself. So use a separate noise antenna and uh, you orient the antenna to where a offending noise source is. And then by properly adjusting the signal from the noise antenna with the, your whatever other antenna you're using, you can uh, uh, null out a noise if it's, if it's from a single location. Again, if we have a uh, isotropic noise or noise coming in from every direction, uh, having a sharp null in one direction is not going to help us much. But uh, we can uh, we can uh, take many things we can do to reduce the, the, the noise level. Again, what we're looking for is signal to noise ratio, not necessarily real strong signal. Uh, now there's nothing wrong with having a strong signal. Uh, that's always gonna be, be helpful, but uh, uh, it's that's the signal that you have at your receiving end is going to be largely dependent on how much power is being transmitted. So, uh, and, and I'm glad to hear that uh, you over there are uh, allowed, uh, you're going to have an increase in power, which is absolutely wonderful. Um, so we can I, I, I should it. just point out um, just to everybody that I, I mentioned to Eric that we were in a consultation document. So it would only be, I ought to put in at this point, Eric, that it is a consultation. It's not guaranteed, but it does look like most people in the UK who are licensed at any one of the three levels will get a higher power. Um, uh, just, just, to, just for completeness, I think I ought to say that. It is a consultation <laughs> and not guaranteed yet. Oh, okay, okay. Well, that's great, and uh, we'll be we'll certainly be pulling and pushing for you. That that's going to be great for both of us. <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah. So uh, anyway, how do we, how do we take advantage of uh, you know so 
not all, all of us are RF designers, so how can you still take advantage of the uh, nearly infinite gain that a, an FET uh, source follower has? And it's uh, one chip that uh, is recently discovered by me anyway, it's been around a little while, is the uh, AD8067 FET op amp. And this is basically uh, has a uh, one terahertz or one tera ohm input impedance. It's a high gain op amp, but it also has FET input. So we can actually get, uh, it's, I, I, I like to call it a, a, a uh, source follower with the gain. So you have all the advantages of a, uh, of the uh, infinite gain uh, or infinite power gain uh, uh, source follower that we showed earlier, FET source follower, but we also have voltage gain. And it's uh, since it's all built into a chip, it's all very stable. We don't have to worry about biasing and stability and all that sort of thing. So if you if you can work with any op amp, uh, this 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 works great. And op amps are very easy to work with, and uh, they're they're. Uh, you don't have to be the circuit designer. You don't have to get into the minutia of uh, of making an amplifier work like an amplifier. So it's basically plug and play. So these these chips uh, they aren't super cheap. I think they're about five dollars a piece um, now uh, in America anyway. I, I don't know if the uh, what analog devices uh, are. I don't know if the pricing is over there, but it's still going to be a reasonable price. And we can. Uh, Use those in in a variety of uh, inputs. I I have two amplifiers that I I sell. One of them is a single end and an amplifier that has a single eighty sixty seven. One has a, a push pull a pair of eighty sixty sevens, which is good for uh, both uh, uh, balanced uh, whip antennas. Uh, it's also good for uh, you know just just uh, loop antennas as well. So uh, a high Q loop antenna. Uh, added to uh, or in com combination with a push pull uh, FET preamp uh, is a powerful combination. Talk about something old now, uh, the beverage antenna, and it's just uh, kind of a uh, how, how many over there are using in beverages? I know they take a bit of real estate, which uh, you, uh, we have a little bit more of here than <laughs> across the pond, but uh, a show of hands here. How many uh, use beverages over there? Show you a, a show of hands, I'm afraid, Eric, because uh, everybody's <laughs> watching this on YouTube. But I'm sure that uh, there's quite a few people who who will be. Yeah. A vir virtual show of hands. Okay, I I didn't know if that was a popular tenor or there or not. Anyway, it's uh, there's a great interview by uh, Harold Beveridge on uh, uh, Hardcore DX is the name of the radio site, and uh, it talks about his early days with RCA developing the Beveridge antenna, which was uh, used for very low frequencies at the time. But it's still a very effective antenna. Antenna, um, it's the old oldest no, low noise, low band antenna. Still quite effective if you have the room, <laughs> and can be combined with modern high tech low noise amplifiers. Uh, back when the beverage was the the, uh, the uh, in its infancy, there weren't that many good uh, low noise tube amplifiers available. That was still really far in its infancy. So uh, it was barely barely out of the spark gap <laughs> era. But uh, combined with the modern uh, op amps, such as the 8067, 80, or, or I'm sure there's even some newer ones than that, <laughs> we, can, we can have a very powerful, very effective low noise antenna. And uh, what people don't understand basically about the, the beverage antenna is the beverage antenna is vertically polarized, even though it's a low strung wire. But uh, if you look at the, some of the details and how it works, it's actually very strongly polarized off the end. And so it's a very different kind of antenna than uh, than uh, most of our conventional resonant antenna. So if uh, you just want to explore a very interesting antenna, if you haven't used a beverage, it's uh, it's really quite an eye opener. Uh, okay, phased arrays. Now, a phased array can be made of any type of antenna, active, passive, full-sized uh, loop antennas, um, we basically take advantage of whatever characteristics our individuals have, and then we can add them together and get uh, even more uh, directionality. And, <laughs> excuse me, and we can also uh, steer them uh, without having to mechanically steer anything. Um, we, for example, we could use mixed antennas. We can have, for example, a small loop antenna uh, or a frame loop antenna and a... Uh, a uh, 
widely spaced uh, or widely separated uh, ferry loop antenna, and maybe even a Yagi, and combine them together and get get a pattern which is the combination of all these antennas put together. So there's really no limit to how many ways you can combine different antennas. But uh, in general, a phase array is used with matched antennas of some sort. Uh, small active antennas are especially suited to 630 meters and 220 meters, or 2200 meters. These are two bands we just got here. Uh, I, you've had them over there a little longer, <laughs> but we're finally getting some interest in these bands here. So um, we're, uh, space is a pri priority or at a premium. Uh, sometimes these can be the only way you can uh, get something on the air. <laughs> And this applies both transmitting and receiving. So this this small tuned loop or STL small tuned uh, transmitting loop is also uh, finding its way on onto 630 meters uh, at least uh, here. I don't know if it's uh, uh, don't have enough experience with 2200 meters to know how effective those are, but uh, I do know that the STL uh, there is some quite a bit of experimentation with that here as well as full sized uh, antennas or. What I should say is full size legal antennas, since we do have limitations on the actual physical length here. And I'm sure your rules are a little bit different there. Uh, let's see. Very loop stick is king on these low bands again, uh, because there's really no limit to how low a frequency you can make. It's just a matter of how much wire you want, want to wind it around a uh, ferret core. And frame loops are great. I don't have a picture of frame loop here, but everybody should be familiar with them. They were used from the beginning radio. It's just basically a, a loop of wire, maybe two or three feet in diameter and two in resonance. And then usually using a smaller coupling loop to, couple, to match that to the input of a, an antenna. Now, my QRP doesn't work. Well, <laughs> actually it does. But uh, one of the points of having some power is we want to overcome the the signal noise ratio issue at the far end. So um, where this is one point where having the power at the transmit end is probably going to be more important than uh, sensitivity at the receiver end. But anyway, there's a little humor here. Anything that uh, we can run current into can work as a receiver or a transmitter antenna. So. Uh, <laughs> Piece of wire you have will work. This is a traditional uh, uh, MF antenna, uh, low frequency antenna for back in the early days of radio. And uh, if you read, a, like for example, 200 meters and down, you'll see antennas like this much higher than, than this. But there's basically this what we used to call clothesline antenna is uh, you know was very effective for for a good portion of early amateur radio. This was the antenna of choice. Uh, phased arrays. This is the woolen Weber, also known as the elephant cage antenna, which was used by the American military for uh, direction finding of distant signals. And this, this pretty much covers uh, DC to daylight, or at least during World War II, II area where daylight was considered uh, the high, what we would now consider high uh, HF. But this, this searches this actually has a rotating pattern and it, it was able to detect just about any hf signal on a planet and pretty closely identify the direction it came from so this is a kind of an extreme example of a phased array antenna now a little more practical for uh for some of us that might want to put together a, a, a steered antenna this is a butler matrix and this is uh with with basically eight antennas and these can again they can be any kind of antenna you want if you want to uh, use a, an array of small tuned loops or ferry loops or even Yaggies, if you have the room for it, this is quite effective. So, uh, or these can even be a, uh, active whips. Each of those antennas can be a, a small active whip. And what we do here is we use these combining arrays with the, the phase shift shown here. <laughs> and what we actually have is we, depending on which port we connect our receiver to, we have, you see at the bottom here, or it's N through eight, uh, that determines which, which direction it is. So each uh, each port you connected on is gonna be about a 22 degree difference in, in directional arrival. 
Now, if we want to automate this, we can have some sort of automatic switch which switches between each of these ports, which will allow us to scan this antenna over a uh, you know, pretty, pretty wide range of uh, azimuth and uh, uh, use that for both monitoring or, or uh, just general receiving. And again, uh, any phase ray is going to have some pretty sharp nulls in it as well. So we can either use this for looking, steering the, the beam where we want, or we can uh, offset it a little bit and uh, have some pretty sharp nulls on here. So this is a general do design for Butler Matrix, one of the oldest uh, methods for generating uh, uh, what we call the uh, beam forming. And this is actually at the heart of the uh, Wollen Weber, which we showed before, the elephant cage antenna. It just has many, many uh, repetitions of this particular circuit. Uh, doing pennants, a pennant uh, flag, and uh, is simply a, uh, a resistively loaded in, uh, antenna uh, that uh, is generally used uh, for low bands, and it's where you have some limited space. It has some of the same principles of a rhombic antenna, whereas we uh, we can reduce the signal coming from the wrong direction <laughs> by uh, using resistive loading. And uh, the rhombic antenna is, is actually uh, somewhat of a it's a mixture of a pa of a transmission line and an antenna, as is a beverage antenna. So anytime you have an antenna which is large enough relative to a wavelength, which, uh, uh, or, or I should say any antenna that has characteristics of both an antenna and a transmission line, we can take advantage of that to, to actually null, null the antenna. So an antenna, uh, an pennant antenna is not a large antenna, it's a relatively small antenna for the wavelength that you're working. But because of this basic, basic design and the resistive loading, we can null out the, uh, the uh, undesired signal. The K9AY antenna, uh, which has two cross loops, is a, is a very good example of a resistive loaded antenna. And uh, so there's uh, been a lot written recently in the AWRL handbook on the uh, pennant antennas and uh, uh, particularly seeing a resurgence in their popularity on these two new low bands. Uh, let's see, um, NVIS, uh, that isn't particularly relevant here, but uh, the NVIS method of using very high angle radiation uh, is uh, good for good local communication for typically if you wanna look, to look at a radius of maybe uh, 100 miles or so. Uh, sending a signal straight up, it has to be below the critical frequency. And this is where understanding how to read an ionosonde is uh, very important. Uh, we, we basically bounce the signal straight down, almost straight up and almost straight down, and we have pretty reliable coverage of a local area. Now, uh, again, uh, there's a limited frequency range this will work, and uh, generally kind of at dusk is where it works best. If we're uh, during daytime and we're above the or below the... Uh, minimum usable frequency, it's not too effective. Uh, and also at night, it's not very effective because generally uh, the uh, the critical frequency can drop to nothing, which means just about anything we send straight vertically is going to go off into outer space. But there's a good portion of the day where uh, vertically or near vertically uh, generated signals are, are useful. And just about any uh, small receiving antenna loop is actually going to not be too directional from from uh, overhead arriving signals. So we can use most of these smaller antennas pretty effectively as NVIS receiving antennas. And high gain Yaggies can also be used part of an NVIS array too. Um, this is, <laughs> if you ever seen pictures of HARP, that's kind of what we, what we, what we have here. Uh, we can phase uh, at VHF, we can phase uh, a lot of antennas together as well and get a phased array. This is a 432 megahertz antenna, which uh, I no longer have anymore. I sold it to a moon bounce guy. So. <laughs> okay, model antenna modeling for receiving antennas. Um, it's basically identical. Uh, if we want to model an antenna, the reciprocity is king. So if we want to model an antenna, what is the, what's this pa radiation pattern going to look like as a receiver? We can use the same methods we use for modeling a transmit antenna, and we can pretty much uh, apply them both directly. Now, some uh, uh, 
4NAC2, which is my favorite antenna modeling program, is also based on the, the uh, NEC2 uh, uh, number crunching engine, has a function there called RDF, which is the received, uh, I forgot the, the received uh, directional figure, which basically gives you uh, uh, a little more useful information for the antenna as its signal to noise uh, properties for receive antenna. So uh, if you use 4NAC2, it has another column there that, that will tell you it's uh, RDF. It's, it's basically it's, it's, it's uh, noise gathering or noise rejection, rejecting characteristics. Uh, W8JI, uh, Tom has written uh, extensively on the RDF figure and uh, uh, a lot of what I, I uh, talked about here, I've, I've kind of stolen from Tom. <laughs> so my, uh, my hats off to Tom, who has uh, uh, just been a, a great inspiration to me as well. Uh, again, <clears throat> reciprocity assures that the radiation pattern gain, directivity, and feed point impedance are the same for transmitting and receiving. But again, we can't go too far with that because we have to realize that for receiving, the uh, the priorities are different. And transmitting, again, we want to get as much signal in a desired direction as possible. Receiving, we want to receive as much as we can from that direction, but also reject everything that's not from, from our desired location. And... Uh, I guess that's about it for now. Uh, for further information, receiving antennas for the radio amateur by me. And uh, many thanks for RSGB for decades of ham fellowship. So with that, I will turn it to our host. And uh, if you have any questions here, um, be glad to answer. Many, many thanks, Eric. Um, well, that's been really interesting. And I've got a few questions, and I expect everybody else has as well. So if you have got any questions or comments and you haven't asked them yet, then please do so either on YouTube chat or on BATC messaging. And please don't forget to include your first name, uh, first name, sorry, and your call sign if you have one in every message. That helps me uh, identify everybody. Um, one of the first questions I've got though is that uh, I don't know. You didn't mention, I think, the proximity that you'd have a receiver and transmitter aerial. But what worries oh, yeah. me is the um, the problem of maybe damaging the receiver, uh, especially if you've got a different active front end, uh, you know, that, voltage that, follower or something. So, so how do you get over that problem? Yeah, there's several ways of doing it. Number one is to uh, use cross polarization uh, with uh, just simply uh, changing the polarization of one to the other. You can get the practically 60 dB of isolation and and sometimes more. So sometimes that's probably the most direct. Uh, method. Uh, you can also use protection diodes on, on there uh, where you can actually turn off during the transmit time, uh, which uh, is not the most effective means if you're running uh, QSK. I'm, I'm a big fan of QSK. Um, I, I just use physical separation for the most part. So if you if you separate them by as much much space as you can, it's usually not that, that big of a problem. Uh, but, but again, if you use standard uh, protection diodes, the uh, 8087 actually has protection diet that was built in. Now I haven't, I haven't, shall I say, uh, uh, challenged them <laughs> to find out how effective they are. But uh, uh, yeah, uh, physical separation, um, cross polarization is good. Uh, uh, the again, when we're using a short whip, the dynamic range does have some limitations on there, so you would not be using that during a multi-multi contest situation. But for general monitoring, it's good. Again, arrays of loops uh, for low band. Again, I, I, I probably didn't emphasize quite as much that um, the noticeable difference in, the, in performance uh, using separate antennas uh, is, is the lower frequency lower in frequency you go, the more you'll appreciate the, the difference between transmitting and receiving. Yeah. Hope that answers. Uh, absolutely. And I guess that um, the other thing you've, you've, you've touched on having a separate receiver maybe with this, because of course most modern transceivers that we buy now, very rarely do you buy a transmitter and receiver as separate boxes. They've always got one <laughs> antenna bot, uh, connector. So you've got to find a way of switching between those two different antennas, haven't you? Well, most of your, uh, at least your higher end rigs have multiple receiving antenna inputs here. Since uh, a single operator dual receiver is becoming very popular, most of your uh, contest type transmitters are, are accom do accommodate that. So uh, that's uh, they've been paying a lot more attention to separate receiving antennas nowadays. 
Yeah, they do. But I mean, just speaking about the, for the average person, the average amateur who hasn't maybe got a yeah. big station with a, a big uh, mm. you know, 7610 or whatever, you know, just a 7300 or, or something equivalent to that, a smaller <clears throat> right. receiver with one. Is it relatively easy to build something like a relay box to switch between two different antennas? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And again, uh, you can even use the, the classic techniques of using the, the TR switch, like it drops a TR switch, uh, which used to be the... Uh, Everybody used to have one. <laughs> Back in the days of uh, novice operation, I, I used what I called uh, poor man's QSK. I had a couple of uh, ARC-5 receivers, which uh, were as broad as a bar door, but they were pretty sensitive. Um, but uh, they had no AGC on them. So, uh, you know, if you overloaded the front end during transmit, it, it really didn't matter. There was no recovery time on it. So <laughs> just put it. Uh, basically put a pair of diodes, uh, reverse diodes across the headphones so they didn't blow your ears out when you're <laughs> transmitting. But uh, a lot of these very primitive techniques are actually uh, were uh, a de, de rigueur for many years of early amateur radio. So uh, some of the older techniques work fine. The CW allows you to do a lot of things that you couldn't, you couldn't get by with on a phone. I, I do have to admit that. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, you mentioned beverage antennas earlier on and asked how many people have got them. And somebody who has is Mike M0MSN. Um, and he's got some comments and uh, uh, about his. The beverage is also very directional, he says. And in fact, he's not grounded the end of his. Um, and also he says that I found that using a gamma match on my magnetic loop reduces the noise compared to using a Faraday loop. Oh, that's interesting. Well, I um, can't argue one way or the other that it's worth worth trying. I'll have to have to experiment with that. Okay, thank you, uh, Ken Lockstone. Sorry, uh, M oh, so it's it's uh, Keith. I beg your pardon. M zero K I L. Um, ben Whit Whitflit of I uh, sorry P E five B. A Dutch amateur has observed the dynamic variations in polarization, left and right hand, elliptical, etc. How fast do these change? Well, that, that's, a whole, that's a whole talk in itself. Uh, I hope you get a chance to read uh, my QST article in December 2010. I wrote an article called Give Me an X, Give Me an O, What's That Spell? Radio. And basically, because of the birefringence of the ionosphere, at least where you have a significant magnetic field, uh, when you launch a uh, a linearly polarized signal into the ionosphere, it splits into two rays. One of those them is clockwise polarized, one is counterclockwise polarized. Now, what's what that has generally done is, or the average observer that we, who can't distinguish between the right and left hand polarization, uh, which uh, very few hams are using uh, circularly polarized antennas on HF. You would not really notice the, uh, well, or you would come to the conclusion that the polarization is random. And the polarization is not random, it's very predictable. And uh, or it's at least predictable with the, as long as the conditions are, are the same. So, yeah, the, you're going to see a significant difference in right and left circular polarization in many parts of the world, especially where you have a strong magnetic field. I don't know what magnetic str uh, strength is in, in uh, Great Britain. Uh, certainly less than the are in Fairbanks, Alaska, but uh, I'm sure it's significant. And uh, so uh, one, of the, one of the reasons that I started looking into active antennas uh, with a great deal, or, and it's, I have a whole chapter on this in my, uh, in my book, is uh, using uh, active antennas that are circularly polarized. Now, at, at HF frequencies, a circularly polarized antenna is going to be big and unwieldy. But uh, using a circularly polarized active antenna, I was able to uh, experiment with this a lot more conveniently. And I uh, basically wrote that to, uh, to encourage uh, other hams to experiment using active uh, cross-polarized active antennas where you could switch between right and right, less circular polarization. Now, as, as kind of a benchmark, this, this is one thing that just absolutely uh, amazes hams, and I uh, encourage them to do it locally. I... Uh, in this particular round, around you know, 20 meters, uh, I, I usually use uh, WWV uh, as a benchmark. But I build a uh, cross-polarized uh, or circularly polarized antenna just using a, a pair of inverted Vs at right angles on a like a 30-foot mast and tune this thing uh, to, to 15 megahertz less WWV. And 
between being the correct circular polarization, right, right hand and left hand, I'll often see a three S unit difference in, in the signal strength between the correct circularity and the incorrect circularity, or the, or the right handedness or left handedness. And this is really surprising. It shows how graphic this, this phenomenon is. It's not merely a footnote. It's fundamental to the way ionospheric propagation works. So we have uh, the polarization is, uh, if you have a circularly polarized antenna, the, uh, as the caller uh, mentioned, it's going to be even more profoundly observed. So hope that uh, uh, when, I, when I wrote the article, I said, this is not the last word on the topic. So it's, it's usually the first word. Nobody's ever even heard of X and O propagation. And yet, uh, if you look at uh, an antenna such as HARP or whatever, we know that all the big boys have been using this uh, phenomenon for years. So uh, it's, it's been very well known and very well documented in the physics uh, community. It's just uh, very little of it has trickled down into the average amateur. Hope that gives a little insight there. Yeah, thank you very much. And I think the book that you mentioned, um, are, you, are you talking about your book, The Receiving Antennas book? Yes, receiving yeah. antennas for the radio amateur. Right, good. There, that is available as well for everybody watching. Um, it's certainly watching in the UK. You can get that from the RSGB bookshop as well. So. Oh, okay. I'm glad no RSGB is selling it. Oh, great. I, I, did, I must admit, I didn't realise it either, and we didn't um, cover that when we did a rehearsal. Um, but but uh, to, um, a Tammy next to me here has just found that on the RSGB bookshop. So that's uh, something to look oh, out for. That's wonderful. I'm honored. <laughs> uh, Tim Bob um, asks, what layer are we bouncing off when aiming straight up? Usually it's uh, the lower end of the F layer. That's why it's, uh, we do have to make sure we have to look at the Amazon and see that we're, uh, we're uh, uh, doing that. We're, we're looking at the, uh, the F layer. The uh, D layer, or I should say, the yeah, you know, the D layer doesn't do any good for us. We want to be uh, we that is the most uh, obstructive <laughs> during the the daytime there. So that is generally we have to be uh, generally toward the evening where the D layer is pretty much going away because the absorption is going to be generally very high at, at lower frequencies. So yes, uh, the lower level F layer. All right, thank you very much. Um, we're getting towards the end now. So if you haven't asked a question yet, or or made any comments, then this is the time to do it, please. Uh, got a question now from Graham, G4FSG. Um, he says, does non-reciprocal propagation exist in the same way on six meters and VHF? That's, I think the jury's still out on that. I don't know how much the uh, birefringence affects on six meters. I think that's real, well worth experimenting with. Uh, I would say it's most, uh, dramatic and noticeable and basically the most shocking on, on 20 meters. Let me give you an example of what we see up here. Sometimes uh, we we will have, a, for example, a typical high gain Yagi on, uh, on 20 meters at maybe 30 feet or so. And we'll hear signals coming from Europe and we'll rotate the antenna around trying to find out where it's coming from and it makes absolutely no difference. So this is kind of strange. So what what condition would cause that to occur. And what it turns out to be is here in Fairbanks, the ionosphere is tilted at about 60 degrees. So if you have an in incoming signal at a low angle, uh, when it bounces off the ionosphere, it's coming down pretty much straight on. Well, if this is also circularly polarized as well, uh, a, a typical Yagi doesn't discriminate between right and left circular polarization. As a matter of fact, you rotate it around all you want and it doesn't know. And so that's that's one of the more graphic uh, dem demonstrations of, of this phenomenon that we have up here. Again, I in Great Britain, I'm not sure uh, it would be anywhere near noticeable, but it, well, I would just say not nowhere near as extreme. It would be noticeable though. But what I would encourage is actually experimenting with some some very simple circularly polarized antennas. Again, uh, a pair of inverted Vs uh, at 90 degrees with the 90 degree phase shift uh, on the Use with you know just a ninety degree phasing stub or just ninety degree difference in the coax length. Then we can switch between right and left circular polarization. I think you're going to see a, a pretty dramatic. You may not get the three S unit difference, but you're going to see something uh, almost guaranteed. 
Thank you. Yeah, um, a comment from Chris G Seven VAO for from a few minutes ago. Actually, he he recommends the MFJ noise canceller. I know you mentioned in your talk about are they readily yes. available, and they are. Uh, MFJ oh, is probably great. almost as popular over here um, as it is in the oh. states, and most of the retailers, the major retailers in this country, do stock them. So, thanks very much for oh, that's that, great. that comment, um, Thank Chris. You. Um, uh, now from Vince G One FBH. Um, he says that you didn't mention magnetic loop re receivers very much, no detailed mention. Apart from the nulls aspect, he finds that they're very good at killing locally generated noise, which of course a lot of us are suffering from now with local noise from VDSL and things, internet services. Yeah, um, well, again, the, because of the nulling factor, I, I can't really speak to the general uh, noise there, uh, but I imagine because they don't have an open, one of the one of the advantages, of, for example, a cubicle quad that has in terms of noise, is you don't have an open end. Now, what when you have an open end of a dipole, you have high voltage gradients there, and they, that can be induced by either lo local sources or just in general. Uh, so I would say the very fact that the loop is closed probably has a significant amount to that because you don't have the high voltage open end there. You don't have any real high voltage points, so that's that's going to decrease noise quite a bit. I don't know if anybody's done an A, a and B comparison between, uh, as far as just received noise between a, a closed loop and basically the same aperture antenna uh, that's wider. So yeah, that's uh, that might be uh, very well worth experimenting with and, and getting some hard data on that. But uh, that's interesting that you that you notice a general decrease in, in overall noise. So could be the fact that also the antenna is just generally smaller when we're using small loops. We don't have as much. Uh, capture area for uh, thermal, or I should say, yeah, we, our thermal agitation, 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 agitation noise is going to be less because basically that's, if we look at how it's generated by random molecular motion along a wire, and those are pretty much noise sources which are added in series, the shorter that wire is, uh, the less less of that thermal agitation noise we're, we're going to have, I, I would think. Thank you, yeah. Make sense? Uh, I think so, yeah, and hopefully it, it does for Vince as well. Uh, Mike M0MSN, I think linked to that, uh, says DXC and I, and I think he might mean by DXC, DX Commander, but correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, and I use a loop, 10 by 10 meter loop on the ground and have found this to be beneficial. Oh, yeah, the, the, the dead loop. <laughs> we, we actually, out in the bush here last, they use actually those quite a bit for NVIS. Actually, they have one uh, over the other. They, they'll put a, put a loop on the ground and they'll put another one up as high as they can. Ideally, it would be about a quarter wavelength, but even less than that. So because it's on the ground, it's uh, you know the, the, pretty much any vertically polarized noise. And, and, and in general, man-made noise tends to be vertically polarized. So a horizontal loop lying on the ground is going to, by its very nature, be reject, reject that simply because it's the wrong polarization. But uh, we have a unique situation here. Our ground conductivity in interior Alaska is so bad that uh, it's it's almost like we're in free space here. I, I've had conditions where I've had I had an 80 meter inverted V up in a up in a tree there, and it had fallen down in the middle of the winter, and I didn't even know it. So I ran all the rest of the winter there, and never noticed a difference in the performance. So <laughs> so that, that's obviously not going to be the case. Uh, Great Britain, but uh, here we're. Is we're, that then because you've got? Lens. Sorry, beg your pardon. Is that because you've got very dry conditions there in Alaska? Yes, very extremely dry. I, I would imagine that. Yeah, from from here, I've never been to Alaska, but yeah, I can imagine it's quite dry. Uh, Keith Lockstone, sorry, no no call sign. Um, ha a question for you: Have you any views if these newly observed plasma tube phenomena are useful to hams? Oh, oh boy, <laughs> that is such a neat question. And absolutely yes. And as a matter of fact, part of our little experiment we're doing down in our, our mini harp down in Wyoming is specifically geared toward plasma tubes. So that's a very good question. And uh, I would say in six months, I'll know a whole lot more. Well, that's uh, a, probably a reasonable way to end yeah. then. And maybe if you do <laughs> the, the, find that one the of these- general channels... Sorry. Yeah, the general category of the plasma tubes is called field aligned irregularities. And actually when I built my when I first started working on high pass, the first uh, antenna I designed was a 430 megahertz radar uh, using, uh, it was the first modeling antenna, modeling 
job I ever did. And I talk about beginner's luck. The thing came up just like a, like a textbook. But uh, yeah, we d actually designed it for looking at uh, field line irregularities before they recognize the plasma tube. So the plasma tubes, that's a real hot item here. And again, I, I will know more in six months. <laughs> well, we might keep you to that and we might have you back on tonight at eight to tell us more, especially if it's an, an effect that which uh, uh, radio amateurs can really make use of. Um, in that little okay. short time, I, sorry. Oh, I, I was just Go gonna ahead. say probably six meters is where you really wanna explore those. Yeah, okay, well that's a, that's a good tip as well. Six meters is, is something for there. Uh, in that short time, we had that last question as I thought, we've had Vince come back and says, as I understand it, the magnetic loops receiver uses the magnetic part of the radio wave while the local interference is in the electro part. If the signal which the local interfer is, is if the signal which the local interference normally. So I don't know if that... Um, <laughs> Well, you know, I, again, I would refer you to W8JI's writings on it because I think he puts that uh, misconception, or he, he calls a misconception, and I would, I, uh, I tend to concur with him that basically any, any antenna is, uh, Maxwell's equation is going to tell you the, the magnetic and field are always going to be very tightly connected, and we really can't separate it as far as the receiver. So I, I think that's probably a misconception there. But I, uh, I won't cast that in concrete, so I would say that's probably. Uh, but I, I would refer you to uh, WHJI's uh, speaking on that on the, the fallacy of the magnetic in, antenna. Yeah, well, it's been many thanks. I think what tonight's talk has certainly showed us is there's still, even with all the technology and all the breakthroughs that we've had, there's still lots to do with experimentation, oh, <laughs> particularly with antennas and. You know, I'll refer people again to your book, Receiving Antennas for the Radio Amateur, which is available from the uh, RSGB Bookshop. Uh, you know, it, it is going to give you a lot of real insight into playing around and experimenting with lots of antennas. I think a lot of us now feel that we can't build equipment uh, at home to sort of compete with the sort of commercial equipment that you can buy now, which you could years ago. But antennas is still one of those magic areas, isn't it, that you can really you know, experiment with and, and, and make some progress and, and maybe even find some, you know, new developments for antennas which will enhance your hobby. Oh, absolutely. And uh, they've always fascinated me. And uh, I, I agree that uh, intelli antennas are not subject to technology. <laughs> They're fundamental with the, into the physics and the fabric of the universe. So I think uh, there, there's going to be no end to what we can learn about them. And uh, I did want to say something about... Uh, well, let's see, the scientific method. I didn't want to go into that here. But basically, there's been so much, for so many years, so much uh, misinformation, or I said lack of, maybe lack of curiosity. <laughs> but uh, we really need to kind of almost start from scratch and, and say, okay, let, let's let's take a scientific method to to measuring antennas. For, for example, you know, for many years, the AWRL has failed to, or declined to publish gain figures of antennas. And there's an understandable reason for that. We got a lot of a lot of bogus claims uh, being made, but you don't want to throw the baby baby out with that water. There's ways of measuring the actual performance of antennas, but it, but you can't be lazy about it. It, it, it takes rigorous uh, work. And I think that's one one thing that where, where hams can kind of get a, a new start on. I said, let's start doing doing the hard work to find out what the real answers are so we don't just keep propagating uh myth mythology all the time and again whai i think has been my uh my mentor and hero in in doing real rigorous science on on antennas and i think that's uh that can set us all on a whole new path here well you've really given us lots to think about tonight eric um about antennas and about you know thinking about having a separate receive antenna to transmit antenna as well Thank you very much indeed for tonight's talk. Well, thank you. And again, it's an honor to be associated with the RSGB, a long history with me. It is on my bucket list to get to England sometime. So. <laughs> yeah, you said, you, you said to me in rehearsal that your wife is from England, so you really will have to... Her family's from Canterbury, yeah. She yeah. was born here, but they're... But, so so we, have, we have very deep roots there. So Well, do come and see us sometime. Once again, Eric, yeah. many, many thanks. Well, thank you, and thanks for everybody with their comments. Thank you. And there we are. And that concludes this webinar. And also, and of course, thanks once again to Eric Nichols, KL7AJ, and also to the team who helped put this series together behind the scenes.
We hope you've enjoyed this tonight today and that you'll be able to join us next time when Peter G3ZPB will tell us all about the Minos contest logging software. Well, if you'd like to see details of future webinars or watch recordings of previous programs in the series, please visit rsgb.org forward slash webinars, where you can also send us comments and feedback. And if you subscribe to the RSGB's YouTube channel, you'll be notified of all upcoming Tonight at 8 webinars, as well as other new videos and presentations from the Society on a wide range of amateur radio topics. And if you're an RSGB member, why not sign up for our emails about online activities, as well as receiving information about upcoming events. You can share your suggestions for topics and, and speakers and help guide our plans for new events just for RSGB members. To sign up for this new service, head over to RSGB's members portal, rsgb.org forward slash members and tick the online events option in the preferences section. But until next time, this is David G7URP signing off and clear. Bye-bye.